shadows, the larger penumbral shadow, which is the shadow of partial eclipse. And you can see on this little cartoon up here that the penumbral shadow is quite large. It's typically the size of an entire continent. So anybody inside that penumbral shadow will see a partial eclipse of the sun. But it's only in this inner umbral shadow, which is the shadow of total eclipse, where you see the total eclipse phase. And as the moon orbits the Earth during the eclipse, the moon sweeps around its orbit, and that shadow sweeps along the Earth's surface and carves out what astronomers call the path of totality. You've got to locate yourself someplace in that narrow path to see the total eclipse. Outside of that path, you only get either a partial eclipse, or if you're completely out of the penumbral path, you don't get any eclipse at all. So on any given date when there's an eclipse of the sun, some parts of the world see it, some don't. Some see a partial and only a very narrow percentage see the total eclipse. What's so special about the total eclipse? It's that one opportunity that you get to see the sun's spectacular outer corona. Can't be seen from the Earth any other time. We can see it from spacecraft. But for us down here on the planet's surface, it's the only time you see this incredible uh, feature of the sun. The corona is a superheated plasma. Its temperature is two to three million degrees. And it's got these interesting structures because it's a plasma. It's heated so hot that it follows the magnetic field lines in the sun's atmosphere. And it resembles that experiment you might have done in high school where you took a bar magnet put a piece of paper on top of it and then sprinkled iron filings on it. And you saw the magnetic fields of, of, of flux caused by the magnet. You're seeing the same thing in the sun's corona. <clears throat> well, talking about the basic mechanics of an eclipse, you might think, well, if eclipses only occur at new moon, and we have a new moon every 29 and a half days, why don't we have a total eclipse every month? And the reason is that the moon's orbit is tipped about five degrees to the Earth's orbit around the sun. What does that mean? It means most of the time during new moon, the moon's shadows pass above the Earth or they pass below the Earth. They don't hit the Earth that often, but at least twice a year, some part of the moon's shadow will hit the Earth and you'll get usually a partial eclipse and occasionally, once every year or two, a total eclipse. But again, that shadow is very small. The, the umbral shadow is very small. And only a small fraction of the Earth experiences that total eclipse. Now, there's a, a second kind of an eclipse that looks, in terms of these diagrams, it looks a lot like a total eclipse, but it's called an annular eclipse. What happens here is the moon's shadow isn't quite long enough to reach the Earth's surface, and, surface, and it sort of turns in on itself and produces an inverted cone. This is called an annular eclipse. And what happens here, as the moon orbits uh, the Earth, uh, that anti-uncle anti shadow carves out a path of annularity. This is what an annular eclipse looks like. This was taken in Toledo back in 1994. And during the annular phase, uh, this, is a, this is sort of a five-minute sequence of how the moon moves across the sun during that five minutes. During the middle of the eclipse, when the moon is directly in front of the sun, the sun is left with an annular annulus or ring around it. And that's extremely bright. You can't look at this without using some sort of filter. <coughs> the thing about an annular eclipse is you don't get to see the corona. You don't get to see any of the other features of the total eclipse. So annulus aren't nearly as interesting as total eclipses are. <coughs> Why do we have totals and annular eclipses? It's because of the moon's orbit. The moon's orbit is elliptical in shape. So sometimes the moon is further away from the sun, from, further away from the Earth, other times it's closer. And that variation in the moon's distance of 14% means that this, the moon's apparent size in the sky varies by 14%. Sometimes it appears larger than the sun, and we get a total eclipse, if an eclipse takes place then. Sometimes it appears smaller than the sun, and we get annular eclipses at that time. So just because an eclipse is taking place during the new moon, and even though it passes directly in front of the sun, you don't always get a total eclipse. Very often you get an annual. How often do these various types of eclipses take place? If we look at 5,000 years of time, from 2000 BC to 3000 AD, there are 
about 12,000, a little under 12,000 solar eclipses during that, that day, about 5,000 years. That average is about two and a half eclipses every year. This pie chart sort of breaks it down by category. About 35% of those eclipses are partial, only the penumbral shadow hits the Earth. About 33% are the annular type, and only about a quarter of them are total eclipses. There's one other category down here called hybrid, and that's a very odd animal. Uh, with a hybrid eclipse, it's total along some sections of that path, the totality, and it's annular along other parts of that path. That's because of the curvature of the Earth's surface brings it into various parts of the shadow, either the total part or the annular part. They're a very small fraction, only about 5% are, are the hybrid eclipses. Anyway, in any given year, they, there can be zero total eclipses, one total eclipse, and in very rare instances, there can be two total eclipses in one calendar year. When that happens, the first total eclipse is always in January, and the second one is in December. So even though we have total eclipses once every year or two, they still appear to be relatively rare because the shadow only covers about a half a percent of the Earth's surface during any total eclipse. Every total eclipse begins as a partial eclipse. In this case, that instant is called first contact when the edge of the moon first appears along the edge of the sun. And of course, during this period of time, this is the beginning of the partial phases, you've got to use some type of protection to look at the sun at this time. Either some sort of solar filters, which you can buy on the internet, or some sort of projection technique. Uh, it takes about an hour for the moon to slowly progress across the sun's disk uh, during these partial phases. And during this time, if you didn't have any kind of filter to watch the eclipse, you wouldn't know an eclipse was taking place. The sky is quite bright, just like a normal day. It's only in the last 10 minutes when you get down to a very thin crescent that things start to change. And if you happen to be near any shade trees and you look at the sunlight shining through the shade trees, the patterns that the sunlight makes below produce crescent images of the eclipse. The leaves and the trees actually look like a pinhole camera. This isn't the only way you can see these things. For instance, if you've got a very scientific instrument, a vegetable or spaghetti colander from your kitchen, and you hold it up during the eclipse, it will project little images of the eclipse on a piece of cardboard. So even if you don't have access to a telescope or a solar filter, you can still watch the eclipse with, with a kitchen colander or any kind of a spoon with holes in it, a straw hat. Um, here's a, a picture through a straw chair, through the holes on the deck floor of a cruise ship during the eclipse. So you get these patterns all over the place. In the last 10 or 15 seconds, before the moon completely covers the sun, the sky grows dramatically dark, uh, from bright sunlight to a twilight. And what happens here is called the diamond ring effect. When the corona fades into view, the sky becomes dark enough that you start to see the corona, but you're left with one dazzling jewel of one, along one edge. So it's a celestial diamond ring in the sky. It only lasts for 10 seconds or so, and then you're plunged into this very eerie midday twilight. It's not as dark as night, uh, even though you might read that the media sometimes runs away about, uh, with, with eclipses saying, you know, um, day, come, day turns to night during the eclipse. Well, it's more like twilight about a half hour after sunset. It's dark enough to see a few of the brighter stars, some of the brighter planets, but it's very dramatic because you are plunged into this twilight in 20 seconds. You go from bright sunlight to this eerie twilight so quickly your eyes don't quite adjust to it. And it's, it's a very strange effect <clears throat> indeed. But what really draws your attention is now this dazzling sun that was up there seconds ago is now replaced by the black orb of the moon and surrounding it is this gossamer halo of the solar corona. I'll be showing lots of pictures of the corona. The corona is difficult to photograph because the inner parts of the corona are a thousand times or more brighter than the outer parts. That's difficult to capture on any kind of a camera. Uh, but your naked eye can see it all. It's a wonderful uh, device for, for seeing this kind of features. And even though I show all these images, there's nothing that replaces actually seeing the eclipse yourself. 
Looking around the horizon, you see the, the, the colors of, of sunrise or sunset surrounding 360 degrees.